proud to be co-sponsoring this series of lectures with the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication and also the, Cron the uh, O'Connor School of Law at Arizona State University, uh, two partners who we've been working with uh, all year long. And we're delighted that you're here tonight to join us um, in this year-long conversation about important issues that we're addressing. Uh, and we've got some university leaders and some community leaders with us here tonight as well. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership is convening experts on free speech and intellectual diversity, and also a broader array of civic and intellectual leaders in American life to explore the wave of heated debates and clashes on American campuses about freedom of speech, civility, diversity, and inclusion. Recent episodes of violence and the widespread concern about a narrowed range of discourse on many campuses are vitally important issues for educators, but also for our broader civic fabric. These university episodes reflect and reinforce the angry polarization and discord that has grown in American life in recent years. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership thus is collecting all of the events from this year's series, the individual lectures, the dialogue <coughs> events, our two-day conference coming next week. All of that's been collected into a published volume of essays. And we're also very happy to be collaborating, as you can see, with Arizona PBS. They're recording all of these events and producing their own version of a series that they are calling Free Speech Challenge of Our Times. They're all being aired locally on, on uh, Channel 8, and then they're archived on the Arizona PBS website. So we started in September with Floyd Abrams, famous for being a lawyer in the Pentagon Papers case with the New York Times, through a series of speakers. We most recently had Cornell West and Robbie George speaking to our two speakers this evening. So just a brief word about <coughs> the school and its mission before I turn the program over to Professor Rusamano, our colleague from the Cronkite School of Journalism journalism and mass communication. He'll introduce our panelists and explain the, the format for this evening. The School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University is dedicated to reviving what we think is the crucial link between classical liberal education and civic education, to make space for this in American colleges and universities in order to prepare thoughtful leaders for civil society and for public service. We offer courses on great works, great debates, great ideas of civic, political, and economic thought, supplemented by internships and public events like this one in order to provide experiences about leadership and statesmanship, all as a foundation for both understanding and practicing leadership in the 21st century world, including our very globalized world. We also think a return to some fundamental perspectives and ideas and debates might provide a broader and calming perspective in our polarized and divided times. So we're here on the anniversary, it just so happens, of Abraham Lincoln's birthday. Our school has organized a faculty reading group this year <clears throat> on Lincoln's political thought and, and his readings. Faculty from some other departments and schools have joined us. So of course, there's a great amount to debate about Abraham Lincoln. What does liberty mean? What does equality mean? What do rights of individuals mean? But all of that is, in the American tradition. We believe in certain principles and we debate certain principles. That brings us to this evening's event. Surely one of the fundamental enduring debates of American life is freedom of speech. The meaning of freedom of speech, both as a legal and political principle, and then regarding its role in educational settings. So I'm very glad, as I mentioned, that we have as one of our partners all year long, the Cronkite School of Mass Communication and Journalism. And I'll turn over the floor in just a moment to Professor Joseph Rusimano, who's been a professor at the Cronkite School since 1994. His career includes work as a television journalist in Denver and doctoral study at the University of Colorado Boulder, focusing on the legal and political theory of the First Amendment and mass communication. He's also an affiliate professor at the O'Connor School of Law, O'Connor College of Law, which is a, a partner for us in this year-long series. So Professor Rusimano will introduce our guests and explain the format, which includes time for questions uh, from the audience and answers from our guests. So please join me in welcoming Professor Joe Rusimano. 
Thank you, Paul. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, the issue of free speech on college campuses is as old as universities and as current as the daily news. That's actually a line from a uh, book that was published last year, appropriately called Free Speech on Campus. There are a lot of layers to this issue, a lot of pieces to this puzzle. We'll look at at least a couple of them tonight. Uh, the, the last time uh, some of us were, were in this room was uh, when Floyd Abrams was here. And I might mention that it was uh, Mr. Abrams who said that the one place where speech is now most threatened in this country is on the college campus. We often talk about these situations in the abstract, hypothetical situations or observe them from afar. But tonight we have the privilege of talking with two people who have lived it. On my immediate left is Allison Stanger. She's a professor of international politics and economics at Middlebury College in Vermont. She received her doctorate and master's degrees from Harvard University. She also holds a graduate diploma in economics from the London School of Economics. Perhaps most importantly for our purposes here tonight, she was in the room at Middlebury College scheduled to be a respondent to a speaker, a speaker with controversial views that some call racist, sexist, and anti-gay. She was planning on asking him some tough questions, but that plan was derailed and Professor Stanger ended up in the hospital. Our guest this evening on my far left is Lucia Martinez Valdivia. She's an assistant professor of English and Humanities at Reed College in Oregon. She received her doctorate in English literature from the University of Pennsylvania, in addition to a Master of Arts in English and Comparative Literature from Columbia University. She's here tonight because she was one of the professors whose class was interrupted, some might call hijacked, by a group of students. So we'll be talking about these uh, issues tonight, uh, drilling down to uh, not only learn more about them, but uh, some of the issues uh, behind them. Uh, again, we'll be uh, engaging in uh, discussion about them, and then we'll have a, a, an opportunity for uh, questions uh, from you folks. So before we begin to uh, dissect uh, what, what's happening here, and, and again, welcome to Arizona State. Uh, let's hear more about these, these incidents. Uh, Allison, maybe if you could start and give us uh, uh, a description of, of what led up to and, and what uh, uh, resulted in the protests at Middlebury when Charles Murray was invited to speak. Sure, just a brief recap. Uh, a student club, the American Enterprise Institute Club, invited Charles Murray to campus to speak. Uh, the political science department agreed to co-sponsor the talk, and I was invited to moderate the talk. And since he's 
was known to be a controversial speaker, they also asked me to ask the first three or four questions to just get us off to a really uh, good exchange. But as you all know, and you can see from the, uh, the uh, clip that was showed, shown, uh, a big protest erupted on site. Uh, it went on for maybe 20 minutes. We were unable to, he was unable to speak. They shut the speech down. So we went to an alternative site to attempt to simulcast uh, the discussion. That enraged the protesters still further, so they tried to shut that down. They set off fire alarms. They were uh, banging on the um, windows. They found out where we were and were banging on the windows. Uh, and um, we did manage to continue and complete that. And then as I was leaving the building, uh, we were met by a mob outside the building who surrounded us. And when they went, they were primarily focused on Charles Murray, but as he began to sort of fall, he looked like he was going to fall, so I took his arm, both to, to steady him on his feet, but also to be sure that I didn't get separated from the group, because when you're surrounded by a large, you know, a number of people pushing and shoving you, you worry about <laughs> getting hurt yourself. And at that point, as I was, took his arm, that's when the, kind of, the anger turned on me. Somebody grabbed my hair, someone body slammed me the opposite way. Um, we finally got to the car, and then there was a getaway scene that was pretty dramatic with students, students and outside agitators, a mix, climbing on the car, banging on the windows, trying to put a stop sign with a big cement base underneath the car to prevent it from exiting. A lot of stopping and starting, which I think exacerbated my injuries from having my hair pulled. And then you know, we finally were able to, to leave. And, and as I said, you were, you were hospitalized. Uh, you were diagnosed with what? Well, it, it, it was a slow realization because at first I was just glad to be alive and I had a lot of adrenaline. And so we went to dinner and I had a martini and was feeling pretty good. But as the adrenaline and the martini wore off, uh, I realized something was really wrong with my neck and went to the hospital. I was diagnosed with um, injuries to my neck and later whiplash. Two days later, I had to go back to the hospital because I was driving the wrong way on a street in my town I've been living in for 25 years. So I realized something was wrong, and that's when I was diagnosed with a concussion. And this happened in early March of 2017. Uh, you recovered, we trust. Yes, more uh, or less. Physically. More or less, yeah. Okay. I'm still receiving okay. some, some uh, treatments. Uh, and Lucia, uh, what was happening on your campus that uh, led to the incidents that I described? Um, a group of students called Readies Against Racism, um, whose mission is to fight institutional racism as they see it at the college, um, had begun protesting in September of 2016. And they continued protesting through uh, I want to say, I think it was the end of September of 2017. So it was a year of protests uh, in the classroom during lectures. Uh, students would occupy the lecture well, which is where um, you know, the faculty lecture from. And they would surround faculty holding signs condemning the course and the faculty, and uh, essentially campaigning visually in that way uh, against the course, against what we teach, uh, against Plato and Aristotle, uh, among other things, um, as being white supremacist texts and uh, against the faculty as being white supremacists for teaching those texts, among many others. And so uh, that's sort of the environment in which the faculty of Hume 110 were lecturing for a year. And this, uh, as, as you have described since, uh, was a, a traumatic sort of situation. It caused trauma. Um, I think it certainly caused distress. I think for any of us with previously existing trauma, it certainly aggravated it and activated it. It felt to me like a hostile work environment, having to go into that, knowing that that was there, having to walk around on what is a very small campus of 1,400 students, uh, knowing that people know you by name, and they know what you teach, and you know how they feel about it. And so it was extraordinarily stressful, I think, for increasing numbers of us as the year went on. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to speak for any of my peers, but I know for me, certainly, um, again, with if you have pre-existing trauma, this aggravates that. Sure. And so sleep loss, appetite loss, not being able to think, I came to dread going to work 
and I love what I do. Now, uh, these incidents and, and others like them uh, across the country s certainly gained uh, some, some national attention, but among the things that uh, focused the national attention on, on these issues were uh, pieces that each of you wrote in, in major na national newspapers, and I would be remiss if I didn't point out that our national newspapers uh, remain a, a viable platform for analysis and, and social commentary. Mm -hmm. uh, Allison, you wrote two pieces uh, in the New York Times, and Lucia, one in the Washington Post. Uh, Allison, among the things that you wrote is, is saying this, I hear and understand the righteous anger of many of those who shouted us down. Uh, to, to both of you, uh, these protests, we'll call them, are clearly pushback against something. Yeah. What? Would you, would you like to go first? <laughs> um, I can tell you what I suspect they are pushback against. I would hesitate to sort of put motives or intentions into somebody else's mouth. Um, but I think there is, especially with the election, of Donald Trump, I think there has been a sense among students of disenfranchisement, of disempowerment, of dramatic and negative change that they've never really experienced before. And prior to that, I think coming of age under the Obama administration, um, which was, I think, for many of us, a wonderful time. Um, they didn't have to deal with the same sort of external fears and pressures that I think previous generations have had to, whether it's Vietnam or, in my case, 9-11 happened my first week of school. That was my reality as an undergraduate. That's a very different enemy to face or fear to face than nothing much in general. And I think when you're isolated on a small liberal arts college campus, especially in Portland, Oregon, if you want to fight, you have to look to what's nearby, and normally those are gonna be many allies, and I think that's where anger ends up getting misdirected. Allison, the pushback against? Well, I think, I think the, the election of Donald Trump was a real trigger for a long-standing sense that students have been, well, we have a problem in our country with race, that we've slowly addressed over time, but there's a rising sense of frustration that it's just taken too long. And Donald Trump is kind of a symbol of that. So they're angry about you know, increasing inequality in our country. They're angry about acts of racism that, that, that are permeating our society. They're angry about perceived injustice in our criminal justice system. All of those things are part of their anger. And it's very, the emotion is very real and I think we have to listen to it and try to understand it, but the sad thing for me about what happened at Middlebury is that their actions actually brought about the opposite of what they were trying to accomplish. So to me, it's, it's very much a question of recognizing the legitimate anger, but at the same time trying to encourage students to see how that might be channeled in productive directions to bring about the change that they want to see. You, in fact, in one of your New York Times pieces did mm -hmm. mention uh, the campaign of Trump and the, the tone of that contributing, uh, in your Absolutely. view, uh, to some of this. Has, has anything changed in the last year uh, since his election? I, I think it's just only gone incre gotten increasingly worse. It's a daily barrage of things that normally wouldn't be said. I, I wonder what, uh, to what extent uh, both of you think uh, you see this on, on your campuses. Uh, and that's what uh, some surveys have revealed and some have written about a, a crisis in confidence in American institutions. Uh, there was a survey that was released just last week of, of 2,000 voters uh, that shows across 27 different democratic principles uh, there has been a decline in confidence in those. Uh, USA Today re recently had an op-ed that also said that public confidence in our institutions is, is plummeting. Uh, acceler accelerated fear not only of each other but of words, uh, according to that piece. Uh, what do you see on your campuses that may reflect this? I mean, I've... I've seen more and more, I think, separation and self-segregation of students into um, groups of who can speak what at what time and where, uh, depending on what your identity is, who has permission to speak. 
because, and, and, and creating closed spaces in which people who are not X identity are not allowed to speak or even listen, um, precisely because I think of this fear surrounding or arising from rhetoric, around, arising from words. Um, it's been really surprising to me that this has been the case. And I think one of the things that it's made me do, uh, certainly in my first year classroom with my humanities students, um, is to try to better understand what they think they know about speech, about free speech, about what can and can't be said by whom and where. And we were, I don't remember what text we were studying um, last semester, but the conversation came around to, well, is hate speech protected in America? And what qualifies as hate speech? Um, and they said, no, of course it's not protected. Mm -hmm. And this was many of them. And I had to walk them through and say, actually, no, that's not the case. This is not Great Britain. Our First Amendment protects precisely what you're saying. It does not protect. It doesn't protect you if you want to incite violence against a particular individual. But what you're diagnosing as hate speech is absolutely protected. That doesn't make it right, but it absolutely is, is fair and equal that that person is able to say that. Because once you start censoring right, the rights of other people to say what they think, that is a very slippery slope. Um, and I think it's, it's trying to get people to think objectively and think about principles rather than specific instances of things mm -hmm. has been something that uh, I've certainly had to double down on um, over the past year. What I would add to that, and I agree with you, is that there's also sort of a parallel dynamic at work both on our college campuses and in the nation at large where you see extremism of the right and extremism of the left, and both sides believing that they have to fight fire with fire, that the other side is evil, and if you don't use the same tactics, you're a fool. Uh, you, you're going to be defeated. And that's very sad to me because that goes against many of the core principles of American constitutional democracy because we're supposed to have a public sphere in which we can agree to disagree, where we can debate issues and what the right approach to policy is rather than calling out someone in an ad hominem way for being evil and therefore not worthy of even engaging with. So I see that on our college campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, I see that in the nation at large. And the two problems, in my view, are connected. If, if we look at the sorts of issues that you personally experienced, if, if we look at them as a free speech issue, and we are, and, and I hope we can continue to do so, then I think one of the, the questions we need to ask is, who's free speech? Mm -hmm. um, freedom of speech for, for whom? Uh, and I think what, what perhaps some are concerned about is they see uh, the First Amendment as somewhat exclusionary, that it's, that it's segregating some, it's freedom of speech for, for some, but not for all. Mm -hmm. uh, are you seeing some of that uh, kind of thinking uh, on your campuses, amongst your students? Sure. I mean, there's a, there's a real sense in an emergent Middlebury that on the one hand, you have people support freedom of speech, and on the other hand, you have people who support inclusivity, and somehow you can't have both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I myself would like to do away with the terms inclusivity and diversity and instead talk about pluralism, and that freedom of speech is actually a means to greater inclusivity, greater diversity, and if we respect pluralism, the idea that there can be a multiplicity of views, and it's interesting to contend with them, we're going to be behaving in a way that's more conducive to having uh, civil discourse in both our classrooms and in the country at large. Yes, and I think to, to maybe add to that, I think one of the things that our students need to better understand, and I think at the, in the country at large that we need to better understand, is that there's not a finite amount of speech to go around. Mm -hmm. right? There is plenty of speech for everyone. We all have our places and times in which we get to speak and other people get to listen. Um, and I think that, for me, has been one of the, the issues surrounding this, the, this protesting that involves essentially no platforming or shutting down a speaker with whom you disagree. Um, I would no more show up to a student meeting and say, listen, now you must listen to me talk about Shakespeare because I have free speech. Right? There's a time and a place and a platform that is appropriate for me. 
um, that does not involve silencing other people. And I think that is something that we need to take seriously, again, on principle. Because if we start making decisions in an ad hoc manner, right, saying this person thinks this, therefore they don't get to speak, or I get to speak over them, um, again, that very rapidly devolves into, I think, shouting matches or everyone being problematic and therefore no one having the right to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe somewhat as, a, uh, as an extension of that, in your Washington Post piece, you wrote, the right to speak freely is not the same as the right to rob others of their voices, uh, which I thought was quite profound. Mm -hmm. um, can you maybe elaborate on that a, a bit more, and uh, particularly if we look at it from the perspective of who is robbing who? I think there has been a tendency among many people to, and I completely understand the impulse, um, but I don't think it holds up to scrutiny, which is if I have been hurt, then I have the right to hurt others. I don't think that pans out, right? And just because you have been silenced previously, that's not going to be fixed by silencing somebody else. Um, that's not how we get to equality. That's not how we get to pluralism. Mm -hmm. That's not how we get to a range of voices. Um, again, that's, that's just another way of ending up with everybody sort of being effectively silenced by different groups. And so I think that's been a very um, important thing to, to keep in mind and keep people working on and toward. I'm, I'm going to guess that both of you support the idea of protesting uh, in spite of what we've seen on your campuses and others and, and, and what has uh, re resulted from it. So in, in each of your situations, do the students uh, have the right to express their, their disagreements, whether it's about the way classes are structured and delivered or with a speaker who is appearing on campus and that speaker's views? Of, of course, there are plenty of ways to express what you believe and feel without infringing on the rights of others. Yes. I mean, take the Charles Murray event. You could protest outside. You could actually attend and ask a really difficult question. You could just refuse not to, to, to go at all and ignore it and tell other people this is not worth engaging. But it seems to me that the one thing you don't have the right to do is interfere with the rights of others to engage or, or shut down a faculty member who is on the record saying this is worthwhile to engage with. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my perspective as a professor of political science, if we can't have uh, someone like Charles Murray on campus who's an influential voice in the Republican Party, well, we can't be a department of political science. We become a department of indoctrination if we can only allow Democrats to speak on campus. So for me, on principle, it's extremely important that he be allowed to speak and I be able to engage him along with my students. Yeah, and I think that distinction between infringing on the rights of others as being the line at which protest, I think, has crossed a line. Um, that, to me, absolutely rings true. Uh, I organized, after the, the so-called Muslim ban that Trump passed in January of last year, I organized the protests at the Portland airport. I believe in protest. I absolutely believe in protest. But there are ways to protest effectively and justly, and there are ways to not do that. And for me, I think one of the things that that I tried to make absolutely clear at that moment, at that protest, was you don't get in the way of other people mm -hmm. doing their things. Um, it's going to do no one any good if you keep somebody from getting on their flight. Right. 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 You're not going to win flies that way mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Um, and if that is what you actually want to do, if you actually want to affect change, you have to persuade people. You can't just silence them because that won't persuade them. They're still thinking the same things. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. not saying it. Yeah. And that's even more dangerous. It's really interesting to me because I also was involved in organizing the um, academics against the executive order on immigration <laughs> petition, yeah. which is just a way of putting out thousands and thousands of people yeah. protesting, but in no way getting in the way of others expressing different points of view. Yes. Right, right. Now, I, I know we're, well, at Reed, we're focusing on uh, an issue other than an invited speaker, but I know your, your campus is no stranger to that, uh, that sort of dynamic uh, as well. I, I want to ask both of you, uh, reflecting on, on those sorts of incidents, um, in, in talking to people specifically about the, the Middlebury incident, I, I've been asked, why in the world would a private college like Middlebury or like Reed, allow a speaker like a Charles Murray to speak on its campus when it doesn't have to. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the premise of, of that question is the private-public distinction. The private colleges like yours are versus a public institution like, like ASU. Um, given, as I say, that both of you are at private colleges, where do you stand on that? Do you see that, that private-public distinction uh, being a factor in your decision making and in your the, the philosophy that you apply to these kinds of situations? Well, clearly at a private institution you have greater leeway in doing a number of things, but to me that shouldn't interfere with the core principle, namely that a group of students thought this speaker was worth having on campus, the political science department co-sponsored the event, and then others sought to stop it from taking place. And so what I've said in other places is that I really think we need to uphold a Treaty of Westphalia between different groups and departments on campus where you just respect the right of another group to put forward what they think is important to engage with, even if you are absolutely convinced that is totally worthless. You let them do that because the reciprocal principle that you will be allowed to do the same. To me, that's just simple human decency. Mm -hmm. And it's also a way of provide, providing an arena at the university where we can have genuine truth-seeking without constraints on it. Because as you pointed out so well, once you try to come up with a decision rule of who is allowed to speak, once you can see the principle that some people shouldn't be allowed to speak, you get into very dangerous territory where the rights of the minority are often suppressed more frequently than those of the majority. Yes, and I think it can end up having unexpected results that are very damaging. And so in the case of Reed, it wasn't a, a sort of, I guess I want to say almost predictably controversial speaker like Charles Murray would be at a left in institution. Um, Reed College invited Kimberly Pierce, the writer-director of Boys Don't Cry Out, in December of 2016. This is a you know, non-gender um, conforming lesbian filmmaker who makes who made a, a biopic about a, a trans person in a moment when that was not being done and sort of began a very important public dialogue about this. And she was shouted down and out of the auditorium by students, including trans students, who blamed or who said she was transphobic and who said that she was making money off the trauma of trans people and had misgendered her subject and therefore should not be allowed to speak because she was a transphobe, according to their judgment. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. And I think that's one example of how those things can go very wrong very quickly. Mm -hmm. So as, as we said from the beginning, uh, these, these issues are not new. But some say that, that there is a difference now. Uh, there seem to be more of them. Uh, they seem to be more, more intense. Um, and I know we've touched on a, a little bit uh, in terms of why, but in, in asking that question specifically, what would you say as to the, the whys of why there seems to be uh, an uptick in this right now? I think it's just enormously challenging as a human being when you see somebody in pain who's genuinely traumatized, and they are saying to you, this is my home, you can't allow this person to speak, and their, their emotions are so intense, I think it's a natural human reaction to say, I'll support you in that, I'm so sorry. In an emotional way, you connect without thinking through the consequences of doing that, and people sort of, in a sense, stop thinking and do what everybody else around them is doing, and that, to me, is tragic because that is the root of almost all evil. When people stop thinking for themselves mm -hmm. and mindlessly repeat what others around them are saying, you get all kinds of catastrophic things. Mm -hmm. But it's still very human. If you're seeing someone in pain, you want to show solidarity. So there's a, there's a legitimately fine human impulse there. But I think we just have to, in a sense, allow reason, reason to uh, prevail. And that's the job of the university. Emotions are great, but you've got to harness emotions to reason to actually bring about change you want to see. And I think especially in this particular historical moment, in this particular political landscape, there are so many people suffering and so many people feeling acute pain and fear mm -hmm. because of language that I think that, that impulse to band together and to think together and to speak together is utterly overwhelming. Um, and, and I think understandably so. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the work of the university is to resist that kind of um, 
what can resulting group think? Mm -hmm. Some have pointed out, uh, and there are studies that actually support this, that uh, some of what we see and why we've seen uh, it uh, increase, apparently, is generational differences. That the, that the generation that's uh, at universities and colleges now is, is somehow different and more, more prone to uh, the kinds of reactions and, and protests and silencing others in some situations than we've seen in the past. Uh, generally speaking, what are your feelings about that notion that this is a, a different sort of generation, mm -hmm. and if so, what might be behind it? it? It's interesting you should say that because I've been recently reading the letters uh, between Hannah Arendt and Mary McCarthy at the time of the 60s and chuckling to myself because they're expressing the same sentiments I feel looking at what's happening around us today. Mm -hmm. So I think these things definitely recur and they need not be permanent. Um, that's what we're seeing. Yeah, and I think to say that, I mean, the, the, I think the impulse to go, oh, kids nowadays, um, you know, <laughs> is, is strong in many people. I feel especially ridiculous saying that. Um, I think there are certain developments that, I think technological ones especially, that have led to sort of different ways of engineering and educating social groups and individuals within those groups I, that I think are maybe doing things now that we haven't seen before. Uh, I think more research and more data would have to be gathered on that um, before making a claim about it. But um, I think there's something different, but it's not related to things that have happened before. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I know there are uh, some others, uh, particularly some First Amendment scholars who express uh, disappointment, shall we say, that uh, in their view at least, that uh, free expression isn't as valued as it was previously and, and, and not by, by this generation, are, are they off base? Are those people who feel disappointment over that off base uh, in expecting uh, everyone, including the current college generation, to have the same reverence for free speech and free speech values as previous generations have had? Mm -hmm. I think if it were to truly come under threat, it would get valued very quickly. Um, and for people who have grown up under systems of actual oppression, um, you know, it's, it's been a very different, they have a very different relationship to the First Amendment than uh, maybe the current generation of college students. Um, I think that's, again, as I said earlier, speaking to my students in terms of what do you know and what don't you know and what do you think is protected and what don't you think is protected, I was astonished because to me, that, that sense of the First Amendment, and I'm, 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 I'm not exactly 18 years old, but I'm not you know, decrepit either, and uh, I don't think I was in, in, in high school that long ago that things have changed that much, but apparently they have in terms of what is being really drilled home in terms of our First Amendment and constitutional law principles at the level of, say, um, you know, social sciences or basic sort of civics class in ninth grade. What are they learning and what aren't they learning? I think that apparently has changed just judging from what is coming into the classroom. It's a real education, educational challenge because as I think you mentioned, we've got a civic education crisis in this country at the K through 12 level where students come to college, they genuinely don't know about the First Amendment. They don't know how American constitutional democracy is supposed to operate. And then you layer on that a sort of historical myopia where they're not really, their historical sense is not as well developed as it might be, and that's something you obviously gain in college. Yeah. So they look at the flaws in American democracy and say, this is just horrible. It has never it, happened it, before. It's never happened before. <laughs> it must end without putting it in comparative context. When you know about what some of the alternatives are, you obviously can become like Winston Churchill and realize, you know, this is horrible, but it's the best of all possible alternatives. Mm -hmm. So they lack that sense, and it's our job to give, give them that. Them that. We're the professors. Um, I, I keep quoting this person by the name of Sum. Uh, Sum. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it again. Some say <laughs> that um, 
that college is a place uh, where students should be made uncomfortable uh, by being confronted with ideas uh, outside of their comfort zone, that that's how we learn, that that's how intellectual growth happens. Uh, Cornell West, a, a recent guest in this speaker series, in fact said that one role of education is to unsettle. Uh, the University of Chicago has a, a pretty well-known policy uh, that echoes a lot of those feelings. Uh, is, is this a reasonable approach, do you think? I tell my first year students that on the first day. Mm -hmm. You're not here to be comfortable. I am here to make you uncomfortable. I'm not here to make you feel threatened in any kind of way as regards your bodily safety. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're comfortable, I'm not doing my job. I'm not making you reconsider how you see the world and how you see yourself in it. I think you should absolutely have a sort of existential crisis at some point in that first year. Otherwise, you haven't really grown yet. Yeah. Uh, and so for me, that's, that's part and parcel of, of education. And this is something that uh, if my first year students watch this, I'm sure they will roll their eyes because I say it constantly, but the point of a liberal education is not to hold up mirrors, it's to open windows. Mm -hmm. It's to make you see people who you have not seen before, not to look at yourself. Absolutely, and, and liberal education is all about perpetual growth, so if you're going to go through four years of college and have absolutely the same views you had on yourself and your world as when you came in, well, then we haven't done our job. Yeah. If, uh, and I think most of us would agree, uh, if the mission of any college or university is to discover and share knowledge, uh, a love of truth and its pursuit, uh, does a speaker like a Charles Murray belong on campus? Oh, absolutely, uh, because he is engaged in, in rigorous analysis with which one might disagree. I mean, the thing about Charles Murray is you can read his work and see some things in it that can't be questioned, data and such, but then there are infer inferences he draws from the data, and that's what you can really challenge. So I think we have to make that distinction between data on the one hand and inferences drawn from the same set of facts. People can draw different inferences from the same set of facts, and that's where you have some mm -hmm. really interesting mm -hmm. policy discussions. Let's, let's change the Charles Murray at, at Middlebury scenario uh, or any guest at any college just a bit, uh, particularly under that heading of if a college's mission is to uh, seek out and share knowledge. Mm -hmm. If it's not Charles Murray, what about Richard Spencer, uh, an avowed white supremacist, or Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, who is labeled by some as nothing more than a provocateur, even the University of Chicago right now is dealing with a battle over whether to have Steve Bannon mm -hmm. uh, on campus as a guest speaker. Right. So when we change the, the scenario slightly in that regard, uh, are we still as open-minded as we are to having speakers on campus who have controversial views? Well, I told um, uh, the U.S. Senate uh, this fall that I would never agree to engage with Richard Spencer. I mean, I think we're talking about apple oranges with Charles Murray versus Richard Spencer. Now, does that mean I would stop students from inviting him? I think if we actually have the right environment on our campuses, students aren't going to want to invite Richard Spencer. Mm -hmm. Students that are doing that, I think, are trying to provoke because they feel like they don't have a voice, like they're being silenced. If they feel like they do, I don't think we're going to see those kinds of speak. Well, 18 to 21-year-olds, you never can predict what they're going to do. You never know what they're going to do. But professors have a range of possible reactions, yes. right? And we can, we can express our opinions about the speaker, and we can certainly refuse to co-sponsor. We can inf refuse to engage. So there's a whole range of different responses one can have. As for Steve Bannon, that's sort of an interesting case because he was a member of the Trump administration. So he's a political figure. And in some sense, you might say that you, know, you can find his views politically offensive, but he was in a position of power, and it, it's maybe worth hearing him and poking back at him, asking him really difficult questions. So you can't kind of have a blanket approach to these uh, complicated questions. And you can use someone to teach or some text to teach in a way that teaches against that grain rather than with exactly. it, right? Just because I teach a text in which somebody is being a misogynist doesn't mean I'm teaching misogyny. 
Mm -hmm. right? I can teach against that. I can teach with it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a matter of sort of dealing with the text or the speech on its own terms and even looking at that as, OK, what is this speech act doing? What is it accomplishing? How is it going about that? Right? To whom is it speaking? And I think part of my job, at least, is to get students away from themselves and more centered on that text or that moment mm -hmm. um, to see what they can really get from it. And so one of the things I do in my classroom is that I police speech, ironically. Right? And, and one of the things I say is you can't word, use this word or you can't use that, that word. And one of the things that we do sometimes is I say, today you can't use the word I. Right? And so then how do you engage seriously? Or it makes you engage seriously with exactly what's on the page as opposed to what you think is on the page. Mm -hmm. Because you have to go to that text and you have to say, here is what is being said. Right? Yeah. Not here is what I think is being said. And that's why a provocative text is a particularly useful pedagogical device. Because if it does make students feel yeah. offended, then you have to ask them, why are you offended? Mm -hmm. What aspect of this argument is problematic? You don't like the bottom line. Is it the assumptions that are being made? Is it some link in the logical chain? And getting them to break that down is a, is a powerful experience. And I think a good teacher can mm -hmm. teach anything. Yes. Right. You can teach boredom. Are you bored by this text? Well, why is that? Yeah. Right? Why are you rejecting this? What is it about this that's failing to engage you? Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about yourself? What does that tell you about that text? What does that tell you about the difference or the gap between the moment of that text production and your moment of consuming it? Mm -hmm. right? And that's just talking about, I was bored when I was reading this. We'll go to questions uh, here in, in just a minute. Um, as, as you've both reflected on the incidents at your colleges and others that you've read about across the country, uh, as that time has passed, uh, what insights do you have? What, what should we be learning? Nuance matters. <laughs> Complexity matters. People are complex and nuanced, <laughs> and people matter. Right? Life is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned for the inspirational but, calendar. But it's worthwhile. Which will be releasing shortly. <laughs> yeah. No, I think I think it's precisely that that getting people to step away from themselves when they talk about ideas, mm -hmm. and to look at ideas on their own merit as opposed to, well, how, what do I think of the person who's saying this? And to teach them how thrilling it can be to engage with that yes. ideas, how exciting and invigorating and life affirming it can be, as to boast of being something that generates fear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe slightly similar uh, sort of question, but what kind of fallout has there been at each of your campuses in the wake of these incidents? I, I'm a bad person to ask about that because I have not been in, in Middlebury uh, since June. I'm on leave in Washington, D.C. So everything I hear is secondhand. So it's not really a good question for me to answer. OK. I see ya. I don't have tenure, so. <laughs> so I'll happily speak off the record later. <laughs> Maybe that's a, a good time for us to, uh, to uh, break uh, for questions. Uh, do we just, we want uh, folks to, to queue up for questions now, is that right? I'm going to take that as, a, as an I don't know. <laughs> Are we able to go right into these right now? Let's I go. All the young men. <laughs> All the men are lined up. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> right, so I guess my first question would be on the matter of uh, how oftentimes administration reacts. In countless uh, cases of heavy-handed protests, you've often seen universities kowtow to these protesters, completely give in to demands, refu not call in security, you know, leave professors like you both to the dogs. So do you think that in part that the faculties, the administration, have an equally important part here in also enforcing the rule of law, enforcing decency in these universities, because that to me is almost one of the most disgusting aspects of it personally. It's one thing for these protesters to occur, but it's another thing for the university to leave its own professors out to hang. I think not just its professors, I think it's students also, mm -hmm. right? Because it's the education process that's getting disrupted. Um, and it's not just, oh, woe is me, I couldn't teach whatever text, I'm really sad about it. It's there are students here to learn, 
and they're being denied the opportunity to learn. And I think it, it is, as far as I can tell, the function of the administration to keep the college running and to ensure that the processes of the college can proceed as normal. Um, so I think there's certainly a, a role there um, that, that could and maybe should be met. Um, Leadership definitely matters. And I think it just can, it can, can sometimes be difficult. None of it is easy, but it's very important that administrators stand up for the university's core mission, which is the pursuit of truth and providing an arena in which that can take place rather than endorsing particular points of view. And that can be very challenging to do because you may wi wind up being disliked profoundly. But it's extraordinarily important to do so because the university itself is at stake in that process. Thank you very much. So my question is just about whether you ever feel concerned about the fact that we're making our students into the primary sort of vessel for our national conversation about free speech <laughs> yeah. as the primary object of concern. I'm just thinking, you know, the framing remarks um, by, by Professor Rusumano about free speech on campus being the largest issue for free speech issues nationally. And so the first issue is that, you know, those these conversations and these op-eds, they kind of are immediately retweeted and spread on social media by some of the figures that we mentioned, like Milo or Richard Spencer. Um, so it plays into the, some of the discourses coming from the extreme right. Um, and also, it might turn students off to engaging and learning about free speech. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something I worry about as a teacher, and I'm wondering if, if you worry about it, if you've thought about that issue. Could you could you just re restate the question? I'm I yeah yeah. Be so sure I understand. Are, are you worried yeah. about making students the primary object of concern for debates about free speech nationally? For instance, if maybe if the press is being attacked nationally by politicians, right? Um, yeah. Mm. Well, the whole conversation just seems to be focused on campuses, and I'm worried about turning students off when they're actually yeah. threatened by I, certain I'm policies that are being this. enacted nationally. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you like to well, that? Since my name was yeah. invoked in your question, <laughs> uh, yeah. if, if you don't mind if I answer, uh, we certainly recognize that free speech extends beyond the campus a, a, as an issue. Uh, the, the purpose of this conversation tonight is, however, to sp specifically focus uh, on the speech on campus issue. Uh, I would, I would uh, point out to you that this speaker series, in fact, while sometimes looking at, at the speech on campus issue has broadened into, into many other areas too. And even aside from that, none of us uh, are under any kind of illusion that the issue of free speech in the country is confined to the campus. And you bring up a great point on the attack on a free press. Uh, what some would say, I'm gonna quote some again, what yeah. some would say is an attack uh, at the highest levels of government right now on, on a free press. Uh, believe me, particularly in, in this building where the Cronkite, of, yeah. <laughs> Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication is housed, we are very aware of, of all of those kinds of issues. Uh, lastly, I would point out to you that the thing that I said at the top, yeah. I was quoting Floyd Abrams, yeah. so, uh, and someone who does know a little bit about the First Amendment and where the, where the dangers are, but mm -hmm. your, your points are very well taken. Well, I do think you are raising questions that are being asked. Yeah. It's, it's not sort of, this isn't a one-off pertaining to this. Um, it is, well, why are we talking about campus speech issues in the national press? Why do we think it matters? Um, and I think uh, Andrew Sullivan just wrote a piece in New York Magazine on Friday about precisely this question. Why should we care, those of us who are not on campus, well, you know, uh, why should we care about campus issues, which I think is maybe an inversion of the question you were asking that has to do with sort of how do we get students who are on campus to understand that this isn't just about campus life, yeah. um, that there are huge things at stake, um, and that this is in a way a microcosm for those bigger questions getting played out um, on the national stage. And I think that is starting to be taken um, more and more seriously and more and more explicitly because it is bleeding into these other questions um, about journalistic concerns and not just censorship of journalism um, from government levels, but within sort of media circles, right? I think that's happened. Um, the, the most recent incidents, incidents I think is with, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name because I've only seen it on Twitter, right, is um, Katie Royfe um, and sort of 
well, if she's going to do this, then how dare anybody publish her and pull all your pieces from that publication? Mm -hmm. um, you know, those are those are real things that are happening right now. Yeah, I, th I think there's a sense that if you can't get it right at the university, you may as well give up on the larger world. <laughs> <laughs> so no. the real challenges. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right, so we know with current climate, especially people my age, early 20s, a lot of us want to you know, see ourselves on the right side of history, and social justice is part of that. Mm -hmm. Do you think one social justice does help lead to censorship, censorship of some speech, and two, if certain schools do enforce not censorship, but kind of push back on certain speakers speaking, whether it's Milo, Richard Spencer, or anyone, do you think organizations should be able to actually sue these schools if they don't enforce freedom of speech? Yeah. I guess I would just challenge people to think about mm -hmm. what it means to be a social justice warrior and who right. were the earlier social justice warriors. I mean, we're just not seeing this here and now. I often tell my students, you know, the first social justice warriors were the Bolsheviks. And what did the Bolsheviks do? <laughs> well, they wanted to suppress speech. So you really have to think about not what feels right in the moment mm -hmm. or just right now as some kind of retribution, but rather where those principles will lead you. And that's, that's a job for educators. I think it's testing those ideas and those ideals and taking mm -hmm. them to their logical extensions, mm -hmm. right? If you, if you take this idea and you test it and test it and test it and test it out to the extreme end of it, if it doesn't hold up, then you need to revise your approach or what you're thinking. And at least for me, I mean, I spent part of my childhood in Peru when Shining Path was running amok. Mm. You can't get more left than Maoist rebels, right? right? Mm -hmm. And what did they do? They killed people who disagreed with them mm -hmm. with words. Oh, I mean, believe right. me, I know all this. Like, so. And it's and it's so it's I mean it's so it, for me it's precisely like this is, um, I think you have to very, in order to understand what one is fighting for, one has to put mm -hmm. pressure on both the terms social and justice, right, right, mm -hmm. and how you understand them separately and together. Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, second part, like you said, if schools don't actually enforce or at least try to make it harder to actually allow certain speakers regardless of whatever or political ideology, do you think certain organizations can sue those schools? I have I, no, I I have no idea because I'm not a legal yeah. scholar. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, but I, I, I would say that there, there were, were some rumblings in Congress that maybe mm -hmm. Congress should do something about that, and I think that would be a terrible idea. I agree. Yeah, Less so. government, better. Yeah. Lots of unintended consequences from <laughs> right. that. So. Mm -hmm. Logical You're, extension. Yeah. Keep testing. Think it through. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I would just share with you that uh, those who invited uh, Richard Spencer to speak on the campus of Auburn University, when the university denied that, they sued. Uh, the supporters mm -hmm. of the speech sued, and they were victorious. The judge said he had to be allowed to speak. Mm -hmm. Best thing to do with Richard Spencer is just ignore him. <laughs> Seriously. Hello, uh, my name is Arielle Salk. I'm a journalist and student here at the Cronkite. I first want to thank you for being here and taking your time. Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned earlier, Professor Valdivia, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, okay. um, that we can teach anything. As you mentioned, you can teach boredom. Looking towards the future, how do we uh, educate uh, in this generation, my generation, uh, on proper proper ways to protest, First Amendment, and and how to have a proper way of getting free speech communicated. Mm -hmm. I think you lead in part by example, right? Um, and I don't, I, I'm trying to remember what it was like. I, I went to Florida State as an undergraduate, so I went to a big state school, um, which is basically the opposite of where I teach now. Um, and I think my professors weren't visible to me as people in a way that I feel visible as a person on a smaller campus. Um, and so there I can just point to my example and say that's, there that is, right? Um, I think in the classroom, depending on what I'm teaching, uh, it precisely has to do with, okay, well, when so-and-so deploys this term justice, right? What is actually being meant by it? Okay, when you use that term, how are you using it? 
right? And so it's that sort of putting pressure not on on terms like say hermeneutics or you know or or I don't, I'm at a loss for sort of random arcane theoretical words at the moment, but um, on the words we use every day, because hmm. words do matter. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's, it's about putting that pressure on those words and what we think we're saying mm -hmm. and what we're actually saying. But, okay. that's, a, that's a good response. And I, I would agree with you that we can lead by example, but maybe also uh, teach students how to fight back with words, mm -hmm. how to formulate killer questions, how to knock out the assumptions from underneath an argument, all of these things that uh, are, are so useful in actually Fighting for social justice. I think. I think having. A, uh, I don't want to swear on PBS, but I think having a <laughs> really great uh, <laughs> argumentative technique is going to serve you much better than, you know, different protest techniques. Yeah. Not that protest isn't important, but I think to know how to reason and how to argue is the best thing we can give our students. Yeah. As a Quick follow-up, had mm -hmm. either of you reached out to the, either the students that protested in your class or obviously the, uh, about the tactics they had taken and the proper channels that maybe they should take the next time they want to get their voices heard? I certainly attempted yeah. to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so I, much. I have too. And yeah. guess, guess what? You know, you re really can't... We're, <laughs> 18 to 21 year olds are allowed to make mistakes. Yeah, no. And there is genuine learning that can take place. Yeah. So that's a positive, hopeful thing I want to share with you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello, my name is Joshua, and uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so this is kind of a two-parter. So suppose if it were the case that some disagreement that leads to violence emerges from preconceived biases, limbic responses, and a misattribution of meaning to terms. These considered, how ought we address these factors in favor of a dialectic? Ooh. Mm. The dialectic. The dialectic <laughs> rears its head. Yes. Oh. Shall we be di dialectical in our response? We could be dialectical in our response. <laughs> Would you like to be thesis or antithesis? I mean, I'll be antithesis. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's all up for that one. Um, now I forgot the question. Um, Providing that maybe a dialectic is favorable over just a dialogue. Mm. A never-ending dialectic, how about that? I guess, I mean, I, is, is, is what you're concerned about essentially crosstalk? Like dialogues that familiar. aren't really, just people talking across one another right. instead of yeah. with one yeah. another. Yeah, no one understands right? each other's first principles. But see, I, I think part of it is that I'm, I'm looking at the conjunction of the preconceived biases, the limbic responses, and misattribution of meaning to terms, right? So there's a lot packed in there. Um, but I think whenever you have disagreement, um, it could be, it could emerge from, from those things. And uh, I, I really don't know how stuff. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm a, trying to practice what I would say, which is to, and, and it's hard to do because we're not trained, we're trained against it, um, which is to listen before you actually begin to formulate your response. Right, and to actually process what somebody has said or asked you, um, and process what they have said before you start thinking of refutations, mm -hmm. right, and taking mm -hmm. those ideas seriously, separately, apart from yourself. Um, that's hard to do, and I think that is something that, that students can learn in the classroom, mm -hmm. um, but it's difficult, and you have to be mindful and say, okay, well, um, I need to listen to this first and separate my response process from that, mm -hmm. because that way you avoid precisely that crosstalk, mm -hmm. and you start building off or against one another. Um, and just to be the antithesis. <clears throat> yes, please, thank you. We can also teach students that an ad hominem attack is not an argument. Mm -hmm. You know, to call out someone's motives or origins as a response to an argument is not an argument. And sometimes students aren't aware that they're using these ad hominem mm -hmm. approaches. Mm -hmm. And so that too can be part of the educational process. I, and, I, and I guess that crosstalk to me is linked to ad hominem attacks, mm -hmm. yeah. where you shut down your ability to listen to someone just because how they look or where they come from or what mm -hmm. they represent. Mm -hmm. You want to get past that. Yeah. Was okay. that dialectical enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just have so much more. OK, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're, come on up. We're starting to run short on time, so if we can keep the okay. questions brief. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, this is more great. of a question directed to you, uh, towards you, Pro uh, Professor Valdivia. Uh, I'm interested in learning a bit more about these protests that occurred 
at your uh, humanities class, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you ever got the feeling that you know the protesters uh, were concerned about the ideas being presented rather than merely the uh, ethnicity or the background of the authors. And if it was the latter, why do you think people are so concerned about something that seems rather inconsequential for centuries old uh, texts? I think it probably varies from person to person. I think they all had separate but related concerns. Um, for some students, it wasn't the texts that were being taught, but they questioned what they perceived to be a faulty fla uh, framing of that content, right? That we were just praising and reifying what was being presented in a text as opposed to historicizing it and questioning it, um, which I don't think we do. But if there's a perception that we do, then maybe there's some work to be done there. Um, when it comes to those questions surrounding, I think um, you wanted to know about the, the sort of perceived ethnicities of authors and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things we try to do in the course, or at least that I certainly try to do in the course, is to get students to think critically about what, as, as precisely was said, was said previously, to think about those assumptions that they're making, right? Why are you calling Aristotle white? Why are you saying that Apuleius, a slave, had privilege just because we're reading his text now? Mm -hmm. Um, what, what did race or how did race mean in classical antiquity where it wasn't tied to color, where it was tied to language? Right. Um, and sort of how are the, the preconceptions we have now, um, how does it actually erase individuals from the past and erase difference from the past when we take these terms and apply them in a blanket way in ways that are completely unrelated to the lives we're discussing? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So you uh, mentioned the issue of student self-selecting participation and then also by extension saying who and who cannot participate in certain discussions. Uh, so where do you think trigger warnings and safe spaces, uh, that issue, um, uh, where do you think uh, those policies may become uh, too restrictive? Um, but then additionally, as you noted, some of this trauma is in fact real mm -hmm. um, and in order to protect students' um, feelings and, and to protect future trauma. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we differ a little bit here because I am I am definitively anti-trigger or content warning, and I think you come down a little in a different place. Yeah, I just am for individual faculty mem members being able to choose whether they want to engage in oh, those practices. Yes, absolutely. That's that's what I believe. Yeah. I, I don't believe in an institutional approach saying you have to have trigger warnings. Yeah, so. and I mean personally, I just I as somebody with PTSD who has been triggered um, in, a, in a real medical way as opposed to an I'm uncomfortable way, um, I take trauma very seriously. And for that reason, I think um, I'm very concerned by what is sometimes, um, to my mind, the trivialization of trauma mm -hmm. and the trivialization of very serious conditions. Um, and I think trigger warnings, in a way, fundamentally misunderstand the way that mechanism works, right? I'm not going to necessarily be triggered um, if a family member of mine was murdered and I see a murder depicted, that's not necessarily mm -hmm. what's going to trigger me, right? It can be a song that was playing at that moment, the wrong color, it can be a scene of a family at dinner, mm -hmm. it can be any number of things, and you can't predict them. That's what makes triggers so insidious. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I just, I set that aside. And I'm also, I'm not a trained psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a clinician. I teach Renaissance poetry. That's what I know how to do. That's what I've been trained in. And so to try to step outside those bounds and sort of take care of my students' um, mental health past the sort of, we all get to be polite in this space bounds, um, is something I'm just not qualified to do. Yeah, and I would just add to that that I teach American foreign policy, which is one long saga of the abuse of power. <laughs> you know, I, just a trigger war, I just issue a trigger warning for the entire course, um, you know, in all seriousness. Um, but um, yeah, that's a good point you're making. And for me, it's really, I, I again, it's like speaking from the place of a trauma survivor, I find trigger warnings revictimizing. Every time I see hashtag rape, hashtag sexual assault, hashtag whatever, I feel that I have been made a victim all over again. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you. 
Uh, I just wanted to ask if you two could clarify on the purpose of protesting, because sometimes it seems that it may be unclear when protesting often involves two diametrically opposed sides that are completely unwilling to listen to each other. So if you could make it a little bit clearer, I would really appreciate it. That's an excellent point. I think protest is a, you know, expressing dissatisfaction with the status quo. And the most effective form of protest involves civil disobedience. I mean, where you're, where you're willing to highlight a rule that you think is unjust or a law that you think is unjust or unfair, and you're willing to suffer the consequences, to draw attention to what you see being the injustice. But I don't think we've seen at Reed or at Mid Middlebury people willing to break the rules and, 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 uh, and embrace those consequences. And embrace the consequences, which is... Interesting. That to me is protest as opposed to yeah, say, debate or a war of words. Yeah. Right. Which I think is what you're. Put yourself on the line. If you really believe in the principle, you have to be willing to sacrifice for it. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for uh, for great questions. Um, before uh, Paul rejoins us, I just want to uh, close uh, with this: that uh, one time U.S. Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis wrote that the attributes of free speech uh, include these. Encouraging thought, hope, and imagination, discussing grievances and remedies, and believing in the power of reason. And we might note that these are strikingly similar to the purposes of a higher education. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, those are encouraging thought, hope, and imagination, discussing grievances and remedies, and believing in the power of reason. So it may be uh, important to recognize what this reveals about the role that American universities and colleges, including their students, can play in contributing to the health and enhancement of democratic values in the United States and globally. That role is fulfilled not through silence, violence, or disruption, but by promoting and adhering, adhering to those values. So I'd like to thank our two guests uh, tonight for helping us to recognize the importance of those values tonight. Thank you. Thank you.